Welcome back. We're talking about the role of militias in U.S. society. Joining me now is David Gartenstein Ross, a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. And from South Dakota, Greg Vecchi is a former chief of the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit and a former FBI crisis and hostage negotiator. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Greg, let me start with you. We just heard our previous guests say that these militias in the United States are very small in number, and they basically essentially trying to seek attention for whatever grievance they may, they may have. But, I mean, if we look at this and what's going on right now, we have a heavily armed group, say, in Oregon, which is wanting to take on the government. How could something like this happen in this day and age? Well, I think, first of all, I think that these are right. Um, they are splintered, they're small, and they do try to get attention. Um, when you first talk about militias in, in, in terms of, you know, what's a militia? Um, what these guys often will do will, will, will pick a, a beef to, uh, or a, a complaint or a grievance, and typically their grievance is with the U.S. government. It might be over a number of issues. Um, it could be things like um, um, they don't want to pay taxes. They don't recognize the federal government. Um, they uh, have a land dispute, like in the case of the uh, Oregon standoff that we're dealing with now. And a lot of times what these guys will do will they'll try to um, establish a legitimacy by kind of making them sound like they're the militia that uh, the Second Amendment talks about. And, uh, but that's, that's just simply not true. In the Second Amendment, the militias are, are, are concerned with a, a regulated, a well-regulated militia. And, uh, and the purpose is that the, uh, to establish security in the free state, meaning one of the states in the U.S., um, against the federal government, they, the states have a right to, you know, pull together uh, people with arms to put together state defense forces and, and state guards and things like that. So, David, as Greg says, they have grievances, and they have decided that uh, using the ballot box is not the way to address those grievances. They are small in number, as we've just heard, but they are heavily armed. What are the national security implications of that? Uh, for this particular incident, I don't think that we need to blow it up to make it as though there are national security implications. There could be, you know, if the incident is mishandled, just like uh, Waco, Texas, when you had the Branch Davidian showdown. There ended up being national security implications in that that was one of the things that Timothy McVeigh used as his own grievance when he went into uh, Oklahoma City and bombed the federal building there. Uh, the, the date of that bombing fell on the same date as the Waco siege, which was not a coincidence. Now, um, in this case, um, the, I don't think there's, there's direct national security implications right here, but let's talk about the broader picture. Mm -hmm. Because in the broader picture, something very different is happening in terms of our national security that didn't exist um, 20 years ago when um, the uh, incidents that Greg's talked about occurred. Uh, things like, uh, you know, at the, at the time of Ruby Ridge, uh, at the time of a lot of the 1990s militia showdowns, you didn't have the same sort of communications technology. Right now, it's very easy for any group with a grievance to broadcast uh, their message to the world and to try to draw followers. And the kind of techniques that are being used in Oregon are techniques of provocation, standing up to government, um, you know, staking out territory, uh, and basically daring the government to do something. The, the weapons are, you know, the, the spokesmen for the group have made very clear they don't care, they, they're not intended to carry out attacks, but the weapons are there for defensive purposes. Now, that's their framing. Other people understand it differently. But um, with the diffusion of social media technology and other ways of, of directly allowing any group to speak to a mass audience, the techniques that they're using aren't that different. I mean, they're different like, in, that, in that these other groups don't come in armed and occupied buildings. But in terms of the communication strategy and the mobilization strategy, it's not that different than an Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter or other, ma or other groups that have tried to um, bring themselves into mass movements. ISIS also uses similar techniques except of mobilization. This group, except this group is armed. Well, I, absolutely. As I said, that is a distinction mm -hmm. in terms of the actual incident. Right, that that does make it different right. than these other than than other instances. I mean, look in the case of Occupy Wall Street, they remained on territory uh, that that they were asked to to vacate in New York right. City. It's not the same as being an armed group, right. but it also is a provocation of authority. Where what they're attempting to do is to generate an overreaction that in turn will mobilize more people to their cause, and that's exactly what the group in Oregon wants. They want an overreaction 
that will mobilize people to their cause. Right, Greg, I want to ask you a question that I asked our previous guest in the first segment as well, and that is, are law enforcement authorities treating these militias, these right-wing militias, differently than they would treat, say, other groups, perhaps Islamic militants or other groups espousing left-wing causes? Well, I think as far as, you know, as far as the response here, what you have here is a barricaded situation. And regardless if it's ISIS or Islamic State or Christian right wing or the Black Panthers or whatever, it's going to be handled in the same manner that the, you know, that the FBI and the local law enforcement is doing right now. Um, partly because we do what we do based on the actions or inactions of the subject. Now, we've learned that uh, as a hard lesson uh, over the years. Um, if you look at uh, 1992, I'm sorry, with, uh, yeah, with Ruby Ridge, in 1993 with Waco, um, there was a, uh, a tactical mindset going into that. You know, in other words, the, there was already a decision made that it was going to be handled tactically, and that resulted in uh, a lot of unnecessary death and destruction. It was very poorly. And um, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that regardless of the subject, uh, rather, and whatever their their background is, their value system, um, their grief, their grievance, um, whether they're armed or unarmed, if you've got a, a barricaded situation where they're breaking the law, and certainly these guys are, they're, they're trespassing at the very least uh, on government property, um, the, uh, the police and the FBI are going to handle it from the standpoint of containment, and um, they're not going to provoke. And as uh, your guest, as Davi just said, that's what they're looking for is provocation. If they were to provoke, if they were to um, threaten uh, someone, or actually take somebody hostage, or there was someone, there was someone in danger, or the police were in danger, or there was a, a, a threat to life, then certainly there would be more tactical pressure being put on. But as long as they're just sitting in there, it's a waiting game, and the FBI and law enforcement are very, very patient, because eventually um, they're going to have to make the move to come out themselves. David, you talked about the broader implications of the rise of these groups. Why is anti-government sentiment on the rise? It, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. Yeah. I mean, we have a government that's very large. It's not very effective at, at many of the things that it, it does. It intrudes more and more into every corner of our life. It's natural that you'll have anti-government sen sentiment. Now, as Greg outlined, they have a particular kind of anti-government sentiment. Um, it's not just that they generally um, dislike government intrusion. It's not a, a Reagan-esque anti-government sentiment, uh, but rather they have a very particular interpretation of the Constitution. Now, I grew up in Southern Oregon. Like, um, I grew up in an area where you had several active militias and uh, got to talk to militia members and they very clearly outlined, you know, their very expansive view of, you know, where the, gov the government uh, is intruding in their lives improperly. One of their theories was that they uh, had the right to make their own license plates and they would expound upon that in, in detail. So it's a very particularized set of grievances and a very particularized notion of what the Constitution uh, actually holds that, right. that militia members uh, tend to have. But we, we should look, we should get used to this. Uh, and I think it's something that, that in the broader picture, again, getting from the specifics to the general, um, it's something that we need to deal with. Um, and. You know, what we have is, is an era where, as I, I said, people can mobilize much more easily around grievance. And so how is it when you have this destabilizing technology? And I mentioned a number of groups that have mobilized, but if you look globally, you know, look at ISIS's mobilization, look at the Arab Spring mobilization, uh, look at, you know, there, there's multiple kinds of mobilization, rioting in London, where people were able to mobilize via social media technology. So some of the principles that I think we need to take are from the economic sphere, where you've had companies try to deal with this economy that moves much more quickly um, and where people's opinions can shift much more rapidly. And Greg, if this is something that's here to stay, I mean, how short is that road from the groups we're seeing right now to groups that become very violent and use violence um, to get their ends? Well, I mean, you know, it, it really, it really just kind of depends on 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 the group what they're willing to do. You know, and uh, typically, if their grievance is bad enough and it, it means a lot to them, and they start to weigh out the cost and benefit 
of, uh, of escalating the violence, and they're going to escalate the violence. But it's very, very difficult, you know, to determine who's going to be violent and who's not, because a lot of people uh, will will talk about, you know, you know, collecting arms and being ready to go against the government and things like this. Um, but at the end of the day, very few actually do. I mean, to, when we look at the right-wing groups, extremist groups in Europe, in Greece, in France, in Italy to some extent, how different are those groups from the ones here? Uh, they're different. I mean, they're different in the sense that you have much more of uh, a popular mobilization around most of the groups um, that we're talking about. I mean, when you're talking about, for example, Poland, we're talking about a group that, that won an electoral victory. Um, in Italy, you're talking about separatist movements. Like, in Europe, you literally, uh, you literally have almost no countries. I mean, the, 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 the number's not zero, but there are almost no countries without a major yeah, but, separatist but or nationalist But those groups show movement. open support for the Nazis. Yes. And um, number one, this group in Oregon does not. Mm -hmm. And number two, despite their open or in some cases you know, quasi-open support for the Nazis, these groups are electorally successful. It's a very different landscape. Um, and look, part of that, I think, would get, comes down to the issue which I mentioned, which is transparency. For all the problems the U.S. government has with transparency, it's a lot more transparent than Europe is. Europe has a lot of problems that are structural in nature, in that you've had this set of European elites with common values who have much more of a European rather than a national level identity. And the European Union, uh, and especially uh, the European Court of Human Rights and other you know, institutions that are, are supranational, they're not connected to a, a given state, uh, have, have ended up taking away a lot of, of rights that nation states used to have in Europe, which helps to uh, add to this level of grievance. You also, of course, have um, you know, some right-wing uh, terrorist attacks in Europe. Uh, Anders Breivik is the most prominent example, right. but you've had a number of other uh, right-wing groups that are active in Europe. Um, so there, there's a difference. I mean, there's a difference in terms of amount of popular support. And uh, there's also a difference in that um, some of the, the like an Anders Breivik is an active terrorist. Mm -hmm. There's this a debate, of course, about whether these guys should be classified as terrorists. And it, it falls into some of the gray area of the definition of terrorism that we use. But there's obviously a world of difference between these guys uh, taking you know, a building on federal land that really just isn't even disrupting the wildlife refuge versus Anders Breivik massacring over 70 people. Uh, Greg, are we going to see this grow in the United States? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, as David pointed out, a lot of this is driven by, uh, you know, their ability to use social media, their ability um, to get uh, news immediate attention, um, you know, and, and these groups can, can connect the other groups and like-minded people, very similar to what ISIS is doing on social media. It's a very, very effective strategy, and, um, and I see more grievances. Uh, there's going to be you know, more political, uh, you know, separation and, uh, and, and social and ideological uh, differences. And yes, I think that um, it's, it's, we're going to see more of it. One thing, one thing I should point out as well is we've, um, in this discussion, uh, we've been classifying uh, this anti-government sentiment as right wing, which mm -hmm. in the Oregon case is completely appropriate. Mm -hmm. But you've had terrorist attacks um, against government targets in recent years that are hard to, to politically put on the right-left spectrum. But I think you, you have a more amorphous anti-government attitude that transcends the left-right spectrum that also, in my view, is emerging and we'll probably see uh, more of it in the future. David is right. Coming from my perspective as a hostage negotiator and as his former chief of the behavioral science unit of the FBI, we focused uh, entirely on understanding the problem from the standpoint of the offender. And yeah. part of our negotiation strategies, it's about figuring out what's important to them, what their values are, so that we can, you know, connect with them, develop a rapport in order to, you know, help facilitate a, a nonviolent resolution. One of the key things that happened and an example of that was if you look at the Freeman uh, back in uh, 1990, uh, 1996, uh, the Freeman did not acknowledge the federal government at all. Yeah. Okay. And, and because of that, the, uh, the FBI negotiators uh, and some of the police negotiators were completely ineffective in talking to them because they had no credibility with them. And so what, what they did was, um, was, was uh, have the sheriff, who they did recognize because he was elected by the people. So at least from that mentality, you know, from that militia 
Um, their viewpoint is that the elected sheriff is the only law enforcement that, um, that matters to them that's valid. So in using the sheriff to do the negotiation, um, that helped move it to uh, a successful resolution. And so it's very, very important, at least from a you know, law enforcement standard, a response standard, is that you've got to be able to crawl in their heads. You've got to be able to understand where they're coming from in order to um, deal with it uh, nonviolently.